thank you all for coming. I know it's the top of the hour. I am Becky Steckler, the program director at the Urbanism Next Center at the University of Oregon. Uh, we're gonna get started here in just a minute. Um, I'm gonna probably talk slowly so that uh, more of the folks that are planning on attending can log in. Um, I'm really thrilled to be talking about um, a project uh, we've been working on with some fabulous uh, partners, AVs for All. Why now is the time to talk about autonomous vehicles. Uh, so first, this is uh, this webinar is part of a webinar series that we've been doing at the Urbanism Next Center at the University of Oregon. And we've been continuing to work with our partners that helped us with our conference uh, last spring. And so we've just got some really fabulous partners, NUMO, the New Urban Mobility Alliance, uh, the American Planning Association, both at the national and the Oregon chapters, um, the um, Oregon American Society of Landscape Architects, um, the American Institute Institute of Architects, both the regional and urban design com uh, community, as well as uh, Oregon chapter, and then the Urban Land Institute, again, both at the federal and uh, <laughs> federal at this uh, national and uh, local level. They've been really great. Um, and then we also have some wonderful sponsors. Um, I'm really thrilled that the Knight Foundation has been a sponsor of our conference, as well as um, uh, supporting the project we're going to talk about today. Um, the, NUMO also supports us, um, as well as Uber, Tool Design, Perkins and Will, Lyft, Echo Northwest, uh, the Oregon Department, um, or excuse me, the uh, Oregon Transportation and Growth Management Program, a uh, joint program between the Oregon Department of Transportation and the Department of Land Conservation and Development, Kittleson and Associates, Ankara Moisson, Methune, Alta, Farron Piers, Parametrics, and Arup um, have all just been really wonderful um, sponsors. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, definitely um, uh, go ahead and enter those in the Q&A box that should be at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we will, we are recording this presentation and we will have um, the slides and other information available uh, after the session. Um, so with that, you know, uh, um, excuse me, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, We've been working, uh, like I said, with the Knight Foundation, um, and then also uh, CITIFY, uh, the cities of Detroit, Pittsburgh, San Jose, as well as Miami-Dade County, um, on really thinking about um, equitable uh, outcomes for autonomous vehicle, uh, both pilots and eventually deployment. And um, you know, one of the things uh, folks, I think, really are kind of asking this themselves is why are we talking about autonomous vehicles right now? Like I know even just a couple of years ago, it felt like there were all sorts of reports about literally billions of dollars uh, worth of money being invested in research um, and development of autonomous vehicles. And it really felt like any day you were gonna be able to look out your window and see a fleet of AVs rolling down the street. Um, However, it turns out that both the technology and human behavior, we aren't quite as predictable as you think, ended up being a little bit more difficult to, um, to build around. And then you put a pandemic into the mix, um, you know, last March, and there were some real serious questions about kind of what was gonna happen to autonomous vehicle technology and deployment, um, you know, Back in March, you saw quite a few companies actually uh, halt their uh, testing, Waymo, Uber, GM Cruise, Argo AI. Um, and basically, they're really trying to figure out both social distancing, um, of course, because many states require two safety personnel to be in a vehicle, autonomous vehicle, while, while testing. Um, but then also, there's just the need to really kind of think about what how was the pandemic going to impact autonomous vehicle testing and deployment? What was going to happen to the market? Um, you know, what about our need to social distance? Um, even a fear of getting in vehicles with other people. Um, so there was really a lot of questions. You know, are we going to con continue to really move around? Are we going to stay home a lot more than we had historically? So I think a lot of questions about what does all this mean? Oh. <clears throat> um, 
And so in the meantime, I would say a lot of the community members themselves were asking themselves, you know, I've got some really different kinds of transportation problems. Like if I really depend on transit, is transit going to survive? Is the bus even going to show up when I need it to? Um, can I depend on the schedule that's out there? Or is it even safe? Am I going to get uh, a disease if I get on transit? Um, can I safely walk to the store? Uh, um, you know, especially as you start to think about how many people um, um, and pedestrians especially are still being hit by speeding vehicles um, that are on our streets. So, uh, you know, so I think there's a lot of questions that community members have and AVs are usually don't float up to the top of it. Um, but even during this pandemic, it hasn't stopped both the automakers and the technology companies from continuing to conduct their research and to test autonomous vehicles. Um, they put things on pause, but a lot of them have uh, really activated again, and they're continuing to test their freight trucks on freeways, uh, their passenger vehicles on city streets, and even uh, their, um, their smaller drones on sidewalks and in bike lanes. Uh, to really think about and continue the, the research and the work that they're doing on how do you put AVs on the streets. And I've got to say, if there's one thing we've learned about the rollout of e-scooters um, and transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft, if communities are not prepared for the new technology when it comes, it is very likely that it could roll right over you. And so we believe that now, before autonomous vehicles are commercially deployed and deployed widely, that now is the time to really think about and put together the policies and programs to make sure that that AV service is inclusive and as welcoming as possible to everyone within a community. <clears throat> um, and with that, um, as the uh, Urbanism Next Center, we've really been thinking about kind of what's a, a framework for thinking about kind of that inclusive service and making sure that uh, it is, is shaped by equity. And so we've come up with our AV initiative framework where we think that there's two things that communities really have to do. They have to identify what the community needs are, and then they have to think about how can they shape the deployment when it actually comes to their communities. So some of the things that they need to do is actually ask people, what is it that you need? So what's the kind of public engagement activities that you really need to, to conduct to make sure that you're um, thinking through, you know, uh, how is this gonna work on the ground? Have you built the trust necessary so that community members really believe that the service is gonna be available to them? And then really explore what are those equity related issues um, that need to be addressed uh, to make sure that um, it's really available to all, uh, whether you've got um, a disability or um, uh, financial issues or technology issues that really need to be addressed. And then taking that information, and it's not a linear process, but really kind of iterative. Um, I think communities are continuing to learn you know, how can you shape that deployment? Um, and really, is it a, a series of regulations that you need to put into place? You know, what are those models of governance or is it more programmatic? Um, and really, at the end of the day, what are the different kinds of tools and levers that local governments have um, to work with those uh, autonomous vehicle service providers and, and companies um, to uh, be able to achieve the equitable outcomes that they're really looking for. So that's kind of the way that we've been thinking and working with uh, the communities. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, hand it over to my partner, uh, uh, Story Fellows at Citify, um, and they've been doing a lot to really coordinate and organize and make sure that we're uh, learning among the different cities. So Story, you want to take it away? Great, sure, Becky. Um, and if you could pull up my presentation, I would greatly appreciate that. Um, I'm having some technology issues and I'm on computer number three right now for making this work today. Um, but so my name is Story Bellows and I'm a partner at CityFi um, and have been leading uh, this initiative for CityFi along with my colleagues, Gabe Klein and Cameron Bridgeford. Um, and we're an urban change consultancy that really helps cities um, you know, create, or we help to create positive change for people and for cities working um, with public sector, private sector, and nonprofit sector. Um, and so this initiative has been one that we have been um, really interested to, uh, to be working on for the last couple of years. Um, again, the Knight Foundation has been supporting both the University of Oregon's Urbanism Next Center and CityFi in working with four cities. Um, so we've been working 
with the cities of San Jose, Miami-Dade County, the city of Detroit, and the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and you're gonna have the opportunity to hear from three of them um, very shortly. Um, and the key goals of this project really are to engage communities to understand their needs um, ar uh, around mobility, um, and then think about how autonomous vehicles can potentially be deployed to meet those needs. Um, we're also looking to engage the private sector um, to understand some of the um, business cases that can actually work um, and sustainably. And then look at what are some of the, the ways that we can leverage our assets as cities to generate um, equitable outcomes for various cities. And as Becky mentioned, you know, we are all dealing with and reeling from some of the health, some of the economic, the equity issues facing our cities. And um, so talking about AVs right now um, is particularly interesting. And one of the things that we've, or we've seen a number of sort of shifts in the ways that both the cities and the private sector are working together to deploy AVs. Um, and so Becky, I am on slide eight, if we can jump to um, kind of talking about how do we, how do we think about um, AV regulation going forward? Um, and this is something that is obviously different in every state, um, in particular communities. Um, thinking about who controls what, and then as cities, what are the levers that they have? When is it that cities want to drive things forward? When is it that cities should be partners? When should we take a back seat? Um, this is something that we're, we're looking at um, in, in different ways, in different um, cities, uh, based on the, the use case, based on the regulatory framework um, from a, a state and local standpoint, um, and then based on the, the relationship with um, the private sector. I think the second issue that we're really, um, that we've seen recently that um, has, has resulted in a bit of a shift um, in terms of the ways that people are thinking about AVs is on the city side. Um, so looking at the, the capacity and staffing limitations um, that, that many cities are obviously facing um, as a, a result of um, COVID and the, the um, economic um, shortfalls that um, are coming in terms of tax revenue um, too many cities. Um, so we're seeing staff deployed in different ways. And this isn't totally a bad thing. Um, and I'll get to that um, again in a second, but it's certainly a change um, from the, the city standpoint. Um, the next thing that, that we're seeing is obviously, you know, we're talking about new business models um, with autonomous vehicles. And the, the unpredictability um, that obviously our economic situation, um, the regulatory frameworks that we have, um, shifting health um, and equity issues in our cities um, has been a challenge for, for companies to, um, to respond to, um, particularly when it comes to thinking about taking pilot projects and bringing them to scale. Um, but moving, moving forward, I think some of the things that we're seeing is that cities really have the potential right now to shift and the freedom actually to shift quickly um, in terms of the way that they are um, thinking about the deployment of autonomous vehicles um, as, it, as it relates to really meeting some of the core needs that cities have. Um, and so I'll just chat really briefly about two um, kind of shifts that we're seeing in use cases. Um, and Becky, if you wanna jump forward a couple slides. Um, we're seeing two large trends here. Um, the first is that the conversation around use cases has really shifted from robo taxis, you know, Uber or Lyft without a driver to goods delivery. Um, so from people to things, um, you know, whether that's medical devices, um, food, uh, there, there are a lot of essential delivery needs um, that autonomous vehicles can potentially meet um, in our cities all across the country. Um, so that's been um, one of the, the really interesting areas that we've seen um, as a shift in the last seven months. Um, the second is really a renewed focus on essential workers and thinking about equity in mobility. Um, next slide, um, which 
Um, you know, I, I think as you hear from some of these cities, the way that they are thinking about, the way that companies are thinking about deploying autonomous vehicles um, is radically different than it, than it might have been a year ago. Um, all of these things I think are actually providing real opportunities to, to test out meaningful outcome driven um, opportunities for autonomous vehicles to work in our communities. Um, and so with that, um, I just wanted to sort of set that, lay that out um, and then we'll pass it over. We're gonna actually hear from um, three folks from San Jose, from Pittsburgh and from the city of Detroit. Um, but we are going to start um, with Andrea Arjona um, from San Jose's Department of Transportation. Great. Sure. Um, so I'm I'm Andrea Arjona. I'm the chair of micro mobility lead for the city of San Jose, and then I've been working on some semi-autonomous delivery pilots. Uh, very happy to be here today. I'm wondering, can you see the presentation at this time? Because yes, can, we can. I don't know if I'm sure. Oh, awesome. Um, so can you move to the next slide, please? I think it's yours, Andrea. Oh, now it's me controlling it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so the city of San Jose developed an AV strategy for testing and implementing AVs back in 2017. And so we've been, um, we had opportunities to test uh, different AV services, including passenger services, and also um, deli semi-autonomous delivery services. Um, and, and the city put together very neighborhood-driven, um, you know, community engagement strategies to try to make sure that um, future AV mobility services would, um, you know, be equitable, would be integrated with our public transportation systems to make sure that communities would participate in the shaping of our streets in the future. Um, and to make sure that we could reduce vehicles, miles, travel. Um, so from, from and this community engagement efforts, um, here's the, the main four things that we learned. Um, there was a significant lack of awareness about autonomous vehicles. Um, you know, when we, uh, when we went to, to neighborhoods, uh, we heard from residents, for example, living in a, a low income, largely Latinx community that they saw AVs as pretty much irrelevant to their lives. You know, this is this is for rich people. Um, so there was like a, a mismatch perception between um, um, people's current um, mobility needs and developing AV mobility services. So it was only when we pointed out, you know, the potential benefits to the communities, like, you know, helping grandma to get to a doctor's appointment when public transit wouldn't work, and no other family member was available to take her or something like that, that people started to see a potential benefit from, from AV mobility services. Another thing that we learn is that, um, uh, you know, pilots can help cities and communities learn and adapt. So we start an idea um, about how uh, this pilot may, may serve this community, but then through the pilot, we identify um, potential um, barriers to access to those services and we can address them more swiftly. So um, the main project that I would like to discuss is um, the sidewalk delivery robot um, uh, project that we started with KiwiBots. Um, so this uh, came about, um, you know, after COVID-19 hit as an opportunity to test uh, touchless of physically distance delivery um, during the shelter in place um, um, you know, that happened in San Jose and, and some people's inabilities to access, um, you know, food and, and medicines and services like that. So um, the, the idea of this pilot was to evaluate uh, what would be the local needs for these type of services and what would be the barriers for businesses and communities to use the service. Uh, we also are incorporating, um, you know, some assessment of equity-based use cases and equity-based deployment. So uh, making sure that this service would be accessible to some communities. And I mentioned before, you know, we have many communities in San Jose that, you know, it's hard in Silicon Valley, they see a lot of technology coming in, including e-scooters and say, yeah, this is not for me. So how can we bridge those barriers? Uh, that's another, another goal of this project. And, and finally, uh, we wanted to identify challenges and opportunities in different urban environments. So um, sidewalk delivery bots um, are not for every single street or sidewalk or intersection. 
Um, so through this pilot, we're able to understand and learn uh, more about, for example, maybe pedestrian crossings or difficult um, uh, crossings for for um, difficult intersection crosses for for pedestrians. You know, if a bot that moves at the same speed of a pedestrian have issues crossing intersections, um, is most, li most likely that a person uh, crossing the street would have the same challenges. Um, so here are the the main takeaways uh, that we can share. Um, about what we learned so far. Um, it's important to evaluate community acceptance um, for these services because it varies by neighborhood and demographics. So even though some communities are super early adapters and we like seamlessly adopt um, an AV service, um, it's important to figure out how do you can bridge the gap between what communities need right now and how these services may actually serve them in the future. So that's, that's something that we're still working on and it's not easy to address. Another important thing that we've learned is that it's important to collect data and insights, insights very early um, to be able to identify potential infrastructure needs and accommodate AVs. Um, so data helps us plan for, um, for um, um, you know, for, for, for whatever we're gonna need in different locales, right? So. Um, a, a service may be good for one area, but then we will need to adapt that area to make sure that the service is delivered. Um, another thing that, you know, that like I mentioned before, that is important is to identify accessibility barriers to make sure that we can serve all communities. Um, so some communities um, actually think that some services are attractive, like delivery bots. They say, oh, I would love to have that service in my neighborhood, but I don't have a phone to open the bot or I don't have a credit card. So how, how can we address those accessibility barriers early on and perhaps build partnerships to make sure that, you know, you're, that, that we're being creative in, 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 in bridging those barriers. And finally, um, all this information uh, that we gain from these pilots help us inform, um, you know, policy frameworks to help us identify regulatory needs, not just for current AV mobility services, but for future AV mobility services. So how do cities prepare for that? Um, you know, it, it's, it's very important. Um, and I had a couple of questions that perhaps we can discuss at the end. And one of the things that we're really struggling right now is um, how do we build a roadmap for adapting our existing infrastructure to AVs. Uh, you know, how, do, how we can ensure that we're planning our streets, not just keeping community needs in mind, but, um, you know, making sure that we are adaptable enough uh, for, for new services. Um, and the second question that we have is, you know, how, how can we bridge our current local mobility needs with the need to plan for future AV mobility services, both from a community uh, and a policy perspective. So, you know, I, I'll leave these questions open. Um, I know we, we'll have some time to discuss this at the end. Um, and that's all I have for now. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, and let's turn to Pittsburgh and Aaron Clark. Thank you. Let me just get my screen shared here. Um, and Aaron, before you jump in, I do want to um, thank those of you who have put some comments or resources in the chat box and would encourage um, everybody to, um, to do that as well. And we will um, get to your questions um, after the, the three presentations. Thanks. Um, Becky, I'm not able to share my turn on my video right now, which is no big deal. I'll go ahead and get started, um, but I can turn that video on if uh, you give me the permission. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks to Urbanism Next and City5 for hosting this discussion today. We're excited to be here. Uh, my name is Erin Clark. I'm a policy analyst with the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure in Pittsburgh. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure, which we refer to as DOMI, is a fairly um, 
young department in the city of Pittsburgh, and we're responsible for the transportation of people and goods throughout the city and for managing the operation of and access to the public right of way. So a little bit of the history of autonomous vehicle testing in Pittsburgh. Um, so although we all kind of think of autonomous vehicles and the technology is fairly new, um, AV testing in Pittsburgh dates back to the 1980s. Um, Carnegie Mellon University here in Pittsburgh began developing um, AV technology in the early 80s and unveiled their first AV during that time as well. Um, but fast forwarding to 2016, that is when Uber began testing its autonomous vehicles on our public streets here in Pittsburgh. And um, since then, four additional testers have been authorized to test on public streets in Pittsburgh. Um, and then in 2019, March of 2019, Mayor Peduto signed um, an executive order titled Self-Driving uh, te vehicle testing and operations in the city of Pittsburgh. And um, that executive order mandated DOMI to release an annual report on developments surrounding autonomous vehicle technology in Pittsburgh. Um, and the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure was also mandated um, to create policies and guidelines surrounding uh, autonomous vehicle testing. So in March of 2019, DOMI released Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh Shared and Autonomous Mobility Principles and Autonomous Testing Guidelines and Submission Process. So our five testers in Pittsburgh that are currently operating on public streets are Argo AI, Aurora, Carnegie Mellon, Motional, who was formerly Aptiv, um, and Uber. And none of those testers are currently offering commercial services in Pittsburgh. We also, like San Jose, have um, an autonomous delivery device deployment in our Oakland neighborhood. Starship Technologies began operating their autonomous delivery devices in September of 2019. Due to the pandemic, they have not been operating um, in Oakland since about April, but um, are planning to relaunch their service in um, January of 2021 here. So as we had more testers coming into the city and seeing um, small commercial deployments um, and pilots in other cities, we knew that we needed to start um, conversations about how to prepare um, for the eventual deployment of autonomous technology. Um, so in spring of 2019, DOMI convened three autonomous vehicle work groups. The first is our shared and autonomous mobility advisory group, which is comprised of representatives from various community groups, bids and advocacy organizations. The second is our autonomous vehicle policy partners group comprised of city, county, and state representatives. And the third is our AV testers, which is comprised of representatives from the five AV testers operating on public streets in Pittsburgh. Each of those work groups meets bi-monthly with DOMI staff. So, um, you know, in Pittsburgh, which is a little bit unique to, to some of the other cities that has AV testing, we don't our residents don't have a lack of awareness of the technology because it's been operating on our public streets and because um, Carnegie Mellon and the other universities here have, have done so much work surrounding uh, autonomous technology for many years. But we, do, we did realize there was kind of a gap in, in education, understanding how the technology works, um, understanding where the technology is in its development. Um, and so, you know, that's one goal of these working groups to kind of educate um, advocacy groups and other members of the public, as well as uh, city, county, and state representatives about this technology and how it could influence um, the various departments and groups that they represent in the future. Um, the groups also discuss how 
autonomous technology can support the city's broad mobility efforts um, and also kind of address how we can leverage the technology to deploy in a way that avoids some of the unintended consequences that we all hear about. And um, it's just an opportunity to have discussions around concerns that some of the group members might hold, um, including, you know, losing jobs and how we retrain certain workforces. So some of the lessons that we've learned uh, in Pittsburgh, um, the first here as a, a bit of background, we have um, a, a connection corridor um, that's being constructed currently. And in those original plans, there was a plan or a proposal for an autonomous shuttle to operate on that connector. Um, you know, the city's intention to, to pilot an autonomous, um, at autonomous shuttle there were um, for the right reasons. However, when, you know, we started engaging the community members, we learned that that was not something that they wanted. Um, they have had been asking for improved public transit and um, accessibility and some, some other things that they had been asking for for years and years. And so when we um, proposed introducing this new technology, um, it was not well received by many of the community members and they didn't feel like their voices were being heard. So it just kind of um, taught us that we need to ask at the start of any project, is more technology the most appropriate solution for this problem and for this community? Um, you know, I think some communities, if you're, if you're trying to deploy or pilot a new technology, even if the intentions behind that are good and the technology could um, be a solution for a problem they're facing, it sometimes feels like the, government is treating that community as a community worth experimenting on. And so that's something we are very sensitive to now moving forward as we explore um, new pilots and explore how autonomous automation can um, improve our city. It's also very critical to know the use case in advance of the pilot or deployment um, and not present a solution in search of a problem we've learned. So it's very exciting, this technology and pilot opportunities um, and funding opportunities, but um, you know, we don't wanna roll out and introduce technology just for the sake of introducing technology. We wanna do it in cases where we truly think it is the best solution for a problem that um, the community is facing. And that is all that I have and look forward to questions following Detroit's presentation. Great, thank you so much, Erin. Um, let's turn it over to Hind Arahu from the city of Detroit. Great, uh, okay, so hello everyone. My name is uh, Hind and um, I am the senior mobility strategist at the city of Detroit at the Office of Mobility Innovation. A little bit of background, the office has started in 2017 and uh, I have joined the office exactly a year and three months ago. Uh, so today I'm gonna to be talking about how we are using specifically uh, our night grant money to understand pre-deployment uh, needs for uh, Detroit residents before we actually start uh, doing any AV deployments. Although we do have AV deployments in the city, uh, we wanted to take this grant to understand a few basics and then be able to offer these guidelines to the private sector, the public sector, and to Detroit residents as well. And I will be talking more about this throughout the, the presentation. So we want Detroit residents to shape how AVs operate in their city, and we want AVs to be used by residents themselves and serve their needs, as opposed to just have deployments in the city that are random or maybe not assessing for the right things. Um, we uh, have racial equity, accessibility, trust and transparency, as well as economic sustainability as the values guiding this vision. And some of the goals that we set for um, the strategy that we put together are building AV constituency and agency among residents. So understanding 
that, you know, the uh, resident's appetite for AVs and also their understanding of AVs before we even like drop, you know, a, 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 a vehicle in their streets. Uh, setting standards for how the private sector must conduct AV operations, not necessarily to restrict uh, AV deployments in, our, in, in Detroit, but more so to offer the private sector more information on what is specific to Detroit that they should be paying attention to. And also promoting a trusting relationship between residents, the city, and stakeholders so that residents are not outside of the loop there, so that they don't feel like they're uh, not part of the conversation, but also so that stakeholders feel that they're connected to the people that they are trying to serve. Um, we decided to have a strategy of flaring so that we can better focus. And this is just short to, to say that, you know, every time we do community outreach, we need to be able to come back and like, analyze and summarize what we have uh, uh, understood and learned from that community outreach, come up with new uh, understandings, and then move forward to more specified uh, or more focused community outreach and then keep going up until we get to the results that we need. Um, so I'll go through these uh, six tactics in, in a little bit of detail. Um, first, clearly defining the Detroit residents' mobility needs. Right now, uh, we have done and completed a baseline assessment of mobility uh, in the city, which is something that you know we we just uh, got from uh, research that's out there, uh, survey results that have already been conducted. Essentially, instead of going into the community and over surveying or surveying on the same topics that residents have already answered or questions that they've already tackled before, we wanted to understand what's already out there first so that we're not reinventing the wheel and asking the same questions. So we did that baseline assessment and we were through that baseline assessment, we were also able to define demographic and geographic focus. So some of the learnings that we got from that baseline assessment was that there's a lot of unanswered questions from, from, from how mobility, uh, from, from the situation of mobility here or the state of mobility here in, in Detroit. Some of them are that perceptions, we don't understand the perceptions around autonomous vehicles. We don't understand the mobility pricing uh, options, if residents feel like they are affordable or not. Uh, we don't have as much knowledge of multiple shared mobility options that are available in, in neighborhoods. And we don't know the motives uh, and the motivations behind what makes a Detroit residents try uh, a new mobility service that's available to them. So geographically, we decided to kind of spread out across the city. So you will see that we have chosen 10 different organizations that are, you know, that, that are covering the whole city, but also multiple neighborhoods. They don't work in each of these organizations don't work necessarily in one neighborhood, but they work in their neighboring area. Um, and they are very active and, um, you know, highly trusted within within these areas. Uh, for the demographic focus, we, instead of going and, and surveying everyone that would be representative of Detroit, Detroit's demographics, we decided to focus on equity groups. So namely seniors, people living with disabilities, low income households, as well as uh, youth. So the second stage is after we did this uh, flaring uh, to, under, to have that baseline assessment, we we're able to map mobility behaviors and patterns. So now we're in the process of designing surveys and interview questions, as well as focus groups, of course, to the extent where we can actually conduct these outreach methods in person. Um, and the objective from this second step is to understand the best practices for community outreach. So understanding what is working now in terms of engagement and marketing for Detroit residents. Because, you know, with COVID-19, as well as uh, just not having that information altogether, I think that that was one of the, the must-haves. The second is mapping Detroit's mobility selection patterns. So how, what, are, what are those patterns that, that, that we can see uh, repetitive? Um, what are the modes that people are using? And what are the motivations behind why they are using these modes? So um, as I mentioned before, there's those 10 organizations that we targeted, uh, but in order for us to have a successful community outreach, we are going to select community managers from these uh, 10 organizations. And then from there, 
they are going to be able for, so, so the community managers are going to be the ones conducting the outreach and we will be providing them and facilitating everything so that they are able to successfully conduct it. Uh, building awareness of mobility options. Um, so now we now that we understand the motives, we understand the patterns, we will be able to understand this is what is available to the traders in this specific neighborhood, or this is what is available to seniors uh, uh, in, let's say, this area, but they are not aware of it, it seems like, because they, it didn't show in the pattern. It wasn't mapped. So then we were able to uh, design better mobility education programs along with the Department of Transportation and also other stakeholders to target uh, uh, the areas that need education as opposed to doing education on everything. Um, and then also eventually understanding the how could an AV education program look like for Detroit residents, but also uh, for mobility practitioners and stakeholders. Yeah, so after we do the education and doing this uh, 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 layered outreach, uh, we hope to now get a little bit more focused from general mobility to understanding AV applications specifically. So understanding, so being able to pinpoint the use cases that AVs can uh, solve in the city and also the business cases that the public and that the public and the private sector can take on. Uh, from there, we plan on having on going back to the community again and now having demos, um, uh, conducting prototyping workshops with the community. And this is when we explicitly mention uh, autonomous vehicles and uh, so that they can like, you know, touch the vehicles, feel the vehicles, maybe use the vehicles as well and give us feedback on the design uh, uh, design features that they would love. For example, for seniors, if they would like to have a, a, a ramp in the, in like, like by the door of the vehicle, or if they would prefer to have something else, or maybe, so just collecting all of this feedback um, that we wouldn't otherwise, you know, think about as just individuals, unless we are living in the shoes of, of, of our constituents. So collecting all of that into a portfolio of, of options. And then from all of this, so the portfolio going back to the maps of the mobility patterns and the modes and motivations to how the traders prefer to receive information and be marketed to, um, we will be able to have better AV deployments we hope to have a pipeline of mobility pilots as well and be able to communicate to, again, the public sector, the private sector, and back to our residents. This is the result of our outreach, and this is what we think your AV deployment, deployment should be focused on. So some of the lessons learned that we've, that we've gotten to uh, realize so far are um, first many groups are trying to study mobility in the city. So, so far we have identified four, including ourselves. And uh, so there's a need for collaboration so that instead of just spending the same, uh, spending money on, the, on, on understanding the same things, hopefully we will be able to uh, build on each other's work to get deeper into understanding mobility in the city, as opposed to just stopping at the surface level of that study. Second, um, learned that AV deployments often focus on assisting the technology. So when we go and talk to AV deployments that are currently uh, uh, on the streets of Detroit, we, we realize that there's a lot of focus on understanding whether the technology works or not. And my job or our job at the Office of Mobility Innovation is to emphasize the accessibility. So like mobility, not just for the sake of mobility, but mobility for the sake of accessibility. So highlighting residents' needs, whether they are met or not through these deployments, and also whether these deployments are relevant to specifically uh, Detroit residents or if they are uh, just general deploy deployments. And then lastly, that uh, government's role is often perceived as a regulator, but there's like a more foundational role to government, which is understanding and communicating residents' needs to the private sector, and that's what we are trying to do uh, first, because unfortunately, and I know that both Pittsburgh and San Jose mentioned that they had um, AV guidelines back in 2017 or even earlier, but, but unfortunately in Detroit, we, we do not have that. And so 
that's what we are trying to, to provide through, um, through this grant. And yep, yeah, that's it. Great, thank you, Hind. Um, and thanks also to Andrea and Aaron. Um, and let's jump into a little uh, question and answer. And again, I would encourage um, everybody listening in um, to please uh, share your questions as well. Um, but I want to start with something that each of you brought up in a, a slightly different way, which is the notion of trust. Um, and I think trust is something that, you know, we talk often about um, on the community engagement side of this, but I, I want to touch on it. So both in terms of what are some of the things that you've been able to do in order to gain the trust um, of, of the community, um, but then also in directing those useful insights um, and engaging with the private sector um, so that those, um, the, the information, uh, um, the hopes and goals of communities around mobility are potentially met um, by the service providers. How are you building trust with the private sector, um, with the providers um, as well? And, and Erin, I'm gonna start with you. Sure, so um, our five AV testers operating on our public streets right now, um, we work very closely with them um, and have had, you know, a good experience so far overall working with each of our testers. Like I mentioned, we meet with um, our testers as a group um, every other month. Um, and, you know, those agendas vary from policy updates we're considering, feedbacks, feedback we're receiving from other groups, questions that we have. Um, we aren't, you know, experts in autonomous technology. So it gives us an opportunity to ask, ask a lot of um, questions to the testers. Uh, we also meet individually just for check-ins once a month, one-on-one uh, -on -one with each of the testers, which gives us an opportunity to have often a bit more transparency with each of the testers. Um, you know, sometimes the testers are willing to talk a little bit more one on one than they are in that group setting because this technology is still in the development stage. So um, with certain subjects or topic areas, the, the testers kind of hold their cards close. But um, yeah, I think maintaining that relationship, having those monthly check ins, keeping those lines of communication open are very important. And we hope, you know, we'll benefit the city of Pittsburgh in the long run as um, autonomous technology gets closer to, to commercialization. And um, so, so far our main stakeholders are residents because we're not doing an actual deployment. However, later on we will, because uh, we, we also received another grant from the US DOT to, to run a pilot for seniors and people with disabilities. Uh, but so far what we are trying to do is to value their time and not waste it by uh, collaborating with the other groups that have already been uh, working on their outreach methods and aligning with them so that we are, instead of having multiple community events, for example, um, and having fragmented attendance, then we can have one community event where we do the back end work and value their the residents time so that they're attending one event instead. Um, we're also actually assessing the level of trust that residents have of the city in general and of our office as well. Uh, so, so that's going to tell us a lot about whether they even, you know, like what, what kind of, how, how do they feel about us? So that's also something that we're assessing. And Andrea. Yes. So with the, with the companies, uh, providing every services like KiwiBots, um, we develop a very strong partnership relationship. Um, we have. Uh, we used to have uh, weekly meetings uh, when we were, uh, you know, um, adjusting uh, the use cases that were going to be tested, uh, where we could evaluate the potential areas where they could deploy uh, the community concerns um, at the time, uh, and this was for the very specific case of, of, 
of uh, touchless and um, um, you know, robot delivery in the middle of COVID-19. Um, so once we, uh, we develop all the, all the sort of like the guiding principles and we have shared goals with the provider um, and the city and the community um, and we deploy a pilot, uh, now we have bi-weekly meetings and we develop uh, reporting uh, frameworks in which um, you know, we can obtain uh, early data and information about potential in incidents, for example, at specific intersections that we can share with our Vision Zero team and that we can learn uh, you know, through technology uh, that is planned for a certain services, we can also learn about uh, public safety matters, for example. Um, so, you know, having that cadence of biweekly meetings, um, discussing a, a number of issues, including not just the technical aspects of deploying in a very specific area of the city, but also the community acceptance. Uh, what are the barriers for businesses to be able to access this service and provide deliveries to communities? Um, and, and making sure that the company is reaching out to uh, local businesses that would otherwise um, not succeed um, because of COVID. Um, so th there's multiple aspects to um, to address, uh, but I, I, I think the most important part of it is uh, making sure that we can build a strong partnership with the provider, uh, with the organizations that are helping the city communicate with uh, with the communities and reach out to the communities and with community members themselves. Great, thank you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, regulatory um, approaches, um, particularly since you all are in three cities that are doing a lot more testing than um, many other cities around the country. And I'm wondering if you have any words of advice, um, you know, or, or key opportunities or critical learnings from your engagement um, with whether it's local or state. Um, politicians, how politics and um, other um, regulatory uh, levels like the state beyond, um, you know, what you and San Jose control, how have you been able to, to work with them in order to um, see some of the benefits of AVs on, on the street? Do you want me to start again? Yeah, oh, Aaron, you can jump in then Andrea. Sure. Um, so yeah, I think the regulatory environment is definitely a concern for, for cities. Uh, we know historically the state governs drivers um, and a lot of traffic laws and the federal government, you know, uh, regulate safety standards for vehicles, which leaves cities with limited control over um, vehicles and, and drivers. And so how that will look in the future with autonomous vehicles is still up for debate. It's unclear at this time, but, um, you know, it's likely that cities and municipalities will lose a certain amount of their authority to kind of govern um, autonomous vehicles. That being said, um, because those laws haven't been passed at the state and federal levels yet in Pittsburgh, we're working closely with um, PennDOT and engaging with them. Um, they recently updated their AV testing guidelines and we um, engaged closely with them during that process. Uh, they do authorize um, the testing of autonomous vehicles in um, counties across the state, but Pittsburgh right now also has um, a local authorization requirement. So we require a certain um, submission from the testers, even if they've been authorized by PennDOT to test here before they can begin operating on our public streets here. Um, I will say in Pittsburgh and in Pennsylvania right now, we're experiencing um, an autonomous delivery device bill that passed through the legislature very quickly. Um, and it's on the governor's desk now. And um, it allows for, I believe, um, autonomous delivery devices of up to 500 pounds without contents in them to operate um, in the public right of way and preempts 
municipalities um, to a pretty large degree from, from regulating those devices. So, um, you know, you have to, you have to kind of get creative and those are some of the questions uh, we're working through with our working groups and just getting feedback from the public as well. Um, because, you know, you have to find creative solutions to kind of manage the public space when, when you're preempted from, from certain levels of legal enforcement over um, these autonomous devices. Andrea or Hind, anything um, that you would like to add to um, to that? I would I would add that um, I think that the use case of delivery because it doesn't have a human in it and is not operating um, on the street yet uh, provides an interesting use case to try to to anticipate the potential challenges that we're going to have with AVs um, in terms of at community acceptance and also the opportunities that to learn uh, about how we can adapt our infrastructure and how we can prepare our communities um, and, and identify additional use cases that can serve multiple needs. So um, I think there's still room uh, to be a little bit more proactive for cities uh, and shape legislation um, and help shape legislation that would allow um, cities to um, you know, to provide services that meet their community needs and that um, adapt to the to the city uh, infrastructure. So if you think about a delivery bot going on sidewalks in New York City, that's probably not going to be a suitable use case. But if you think of a city like San Jose that has a, a more suburban um, uh, shape, um, there's th there are modes that that could be suitable. Uh, for certain locales. So also understanding that um, it's important not to preempt cities uh, to, to develop different use cases and to develop different pilots that would allow them to build regulations that will uh, serve their community needs. That's something that I think cities need to be a little bit more proactive about. Great, um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Becky for a last question um, and then to close us out. Excellent, great. We did get one question uh, that really focused on jobs um, and the concerns that autonomous vehicles are really going to have a significant impact, especially on delivery jobs or driving jobs. And I wanted to touch on the two projects uh, that are working with uh, Urban Delivery Services, uh, uh, Andrea in San Jose, as well as Aaron in Pittsburgh, because we've had some conversations about how the delivery services, especially in the time of COVID, um, can support uh, local, local jobs. And we focus specifically on the delivery fee and what kind of impact that had on uh, on on, uh, on those local businesses, and so um, uh, Aaron, do you want to talk just? A, you want to start us off and talk about kind of how you've been thinking about that in Pittsburgh? Sure. So, in terms of um, you know the potential for for jobs lost um, with automation, um, I, I don't think Pittsburgh has you know. A solution to provide, unfortunately, yet. But I, I know, like some of our discussions we've had with um, some of our advocacy groups, who obviously are concerned about this, are just that we need to start planning now for job training programs, um, working with these industries, so that we have a plan in place. So, um, you know, if this technology replaces some part of that job, that. Um, we don't have an entire industry of workers left out of work. And I know in terms of the delivery devices in particular, you know, there is still a role that humans play. Like there's kind of with um, Starship at least, there are humans who are overseeing a number of the devices at any given time. And so if a human needs to take over and control the device, they can do that remotely. And so there's opportunities um, and you know, humans still are going to play a role, even if these devices are operating mostly in um, autonomous mode. Um, you know, we get similar questions and have had conversations around public transit as well. Like, if automation were to ever, um, you know, be be incorporated into public transit, and 
the the role of a of a bus driver or public transit provider is just so important we know that a human is never not going to be in those vehicles they offer so many other services outside of physically driving the bus and so we you know have brainstormed different opportunities for kind of retraining and still keeping humans um, focusing on kind of other responsibilities in those roles. Andrea, do you want to just really briefly, I know we're at the top of the hour and I've got a few last things to say before we're done. Yes, sure. So I think in the, in the specific case of delivery bots, there's opportunities for job transfer from, you know, typical delivery. Somebody has to load the bot, somebody has to teleoperate the bot, like Erin mentioned, uh, in case of emergency. Um, and most importantly, these type of pilots uh, will help us identify if there's a potential uh, job loss or if there's a need for retraining. So early and um, learning early about these challenges will help us build in regulatory frameworks or policy that uh, would uh, ask these providers, these new operators to um, implement measures to mitigate these, these issues, you know, uh, make a commitment to retrain or help retrain um, previous uh, del delivery employees into the, for example, the Kiwi bot service. So I think just the learning aspect uh, through the pilot is what really helps CD um, understand. Um, it, it's more more than a job loss. Where is the job shift, and what does the city need to do in order to mitigate that, and what can the city um, ask from the vendor or the operator um, to try to help mitigate this as well. Excellent. I just want to thank all of our panelists, uh, as well as a story from Citify. Thank you all so much for being with us today. Thank you to all the attendees. Uh, you know, this is actually a great point to say uh, some of these projects are just uh, starting off. And while we have some lessons learned, we're, we're continuing to learn and, and plan on uh, doing that for at least the next year and a half. Uh, and so uh, uh, just as a, a follow-up as well, we will put all of the uh, slide decks as well as the video up on our website um, probably within about a week or so. And then uh, we're pretty excited. We're going to be uh, launching a Medium website that will have additional information about the project and what we've been learning. And then finally, uh, Urbanism Next is planning on uh, uh, publishing two uh, white papers, one that really dives in a lot deeper into the autonomous vehicle framework, and then uh, the preliminary lessons learned. We're looking both at autonomous vehicle pilots as well as other new mobility pilots to really think about, you know, what's the roadmap uh, for moving forward with autonomical, aut <laughs> autonomous vehicle deployment. Uh, and so with that, I'll just thank everyone and uh, wish you all a great day. Thank you.